Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Open Orchard Bud Grafting and Summer Tree Care webinar with Sam Van Aken. My name is Claudia. I am an outreach coordinator at Green Thumb. We're the division of the Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. Thank you to all of you to, for joining us. Thanks again to our facilitator, Sam Van Aken, artist and orchardist. Um, so we appreciate everybody tuning in. We're still in a pandemic, so still very uncertain times. So Green Thumb again is grateful to everybody, especially our community gardens, um, for keeping their communities healthy and safe. And we hope that everybody continues to remain safe as well. So housekeeping rules that many of you already heard me say, um, it is important for everybody to please stay muted. I'm gonna do my best to keep everyone except the facilitator muted. If you have a question or a comment, just please type it in the chat box and I will read your question out loud during question and answer session. So you feel free to practice typing in the chat box, share your name, if you're from a garden or what brought you to this workshop, just in case you're new to WebEx. Um, again, you can choose whether or not your camera is on by clicking the, the camera icon. Um, and uh, Green Thumb is still sort of new to webinars. We've been doing this for about four months now, so still new. So please forgive us for any technical difficulties that we may experience. Please be patient with us. Um, so again, we are recording this session. If you don't want to be on camera, you can turn it off, but the camera is focused the whole time on Sam Van Aken, the facilitator. Um, so now I wanna introduce, before introducing Sam, I want to introduce Shane Brennan, who's the Director of Public Programs, who's gonna be telling you a little bit more about this workshop series at Governor's Island and a little bit about Sam's work, and he will be introducing Sam. So I am going to turn it over to Shane now. Thank you, Claudia. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Um, awesome. So, uh, sorry, I'm not on video. I uh, have a storm passing through where I am, so I'm on the phone. Um, but I want to give a special thanks to Claudia for moderating today and for Mara and the entire team over at Green Thumb for being our wonderful partners and co-organizing this workshop series with us. Um, as Claudia mentioned, I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Trust for Governor's Island. For those of you who aren't familiar, the 172 acre island off the tip of Manhattan uh, with a mix of historic buildings and open public spaces. Um, we have a public art program that involves commissioning new work by groundbreaking artists who are exploring the relationship between the island, local New York City history, and really big pressing questions about our climate and environment. And we've been incredibly lucky to work with the island called the Open Orchard, um, which was the inspiration for this workshop today. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about that project and Sam's practice, just as context for what we're gonna learn together today. Um, once complete, this project will take the form of a public orchard of 50 hybrid fruit trees containing hundreds of rare and heirloom varieties. What's really amazing is that centuries ago, these varieties actually grew in and around New York City, but they've mostly disappeared with the rise of industrial scale agriculture. And in some cases, Sam will be regrowing fruits that haven't existed in our region for more than 300 years. Um, we currently have about 300 trees growing on uh, Governor's Island in a tree nursery that Sam has set up. 50 of those trees, when they're large enough, are gonna be planted on the island sometime next year. And hundreds more will be distributed to community gardens across the city with the help of Green Thumb. Um, and we're hoping that through these workshops, we'll get to meet a lot of local growers at those different community gardens who may want to adopt one of these trees and learn to care for it. The Open Orchard is an extension of Sam's ongoing work with fruit trees over the past decade. His Tree of 40 Fruit Project, for example, involves creating single trees that produce 40 different varieties of stone fruit, with peaches growing next to cherries, apricots, plums, and nectarines, and they blossom in this amazing array of colors. Sam has been cultivating these tree, trees in locations across the country, and now he's gonna create an entire orchard on Governor's Island. Um, and as you may already know, he uses a process of grafting to create these trees. 
um, and he's going to teach you a little bit about that process today. Um, you know, to me as a novice, grafting still feels kind of magical, um, but what's really amazing is that it's something that we can all learn to do. And it serves this really important purpose beyond making these cool Frankenstein trees. Grafting actually allows a single tree, or in this case an orchard, to contain a much greater amount of biodiversity. Um, at the same time as biodiversity is being eliminated from our food supply, making them more vulnerable and at risk of collapse. Um, so I think there's a lot of really interesting ideas here. Um, and you're going to learn this practical skill that kind of talks about the history of agriculture and also its future. Um, there's obviously a lot more that I would love to say, and I could go on and on about Sam's incredible work, um, but I'll leave it there for now and just encourage you to check out the Governor's Island website and our newsletters and to follow along as Sam's project starts, starts to take root on the island over the next year or so. Um, and if you're in the New York City area, um, I also hope you'll come and visit us on the island. Um, we're reopening next Wednesday, July 15th, which is super exciting. Um, so hopefully see you out there um, and uh, at these workshops as they continue in the future. Um, thank you again for joining. Um, I'll hand it back over to Claudia to get things started. Thank you, Shane, for that really great introduction. So now that everybody has the context about this amazing project, I'm going to turn it over to Sam, and he's going to take it away with the workshop. And just a kind reminder to please stay on mute. I'll be collecting your questions and comments. All right, Sam, it's all you. Great. Uh, thank you, Claudia and Shane. And uh, I hope everybody is doing well. And uh, thanks for, for joining in and taking the time uh, for this workshop. Um, I was hoping to do this uh, workshop at one of the actual Tree of 40 Fruits. Uh, there's one here in Syracuse, New York. It's on the Syracuse campus. And it's loaded with fruit. Um, it's just they haven't reopened yet. So I think what I'll do is later on, I'll take some photographs and um, I'll make sure that they can get posted to the Green Thumb site so you can get an idea. Um, so today we're going to talk about summer tree care and budding um, or bud grafting. And uh, yeah, so this is the third workshop that we've done with Green Thumb. And um, since the last, I thought I would go over some of the things that I've done just with these trees since the last workshop. So these trees are all uh, what they call a mother block of trees. And a mother block is trees that you'll actually grow not for fruit, but in order to collect branches from. And you use those branches on, on grafting. And um, since I've been homebound like everybody else, uh, I've had lots of time to experiment. Um, so I thought I would uh, start with going over the success and failures of the, the experiments this year. Uh, a lot of what I do is um, revisiting past ways of, of growing trees. So sort of pre 20th century or pre modern ways of growing uh, trees and some of the things that they, they use. Uh, because you often find that those methods are a lot more uh, organic and they're also a lot more holistic. Uh, than just dumping pesticides on the tree. So uh, one of the things that I tried this year is um, I tried scraping the tree trunks. I read uh, in this book, it's uh, Downing's Fruit and Fruit Trees of America, which was uh, published in sort of the eight, I think it was, yeah, it was 1858. And um, it, it was sort of this culmination of all of uh, the knowledge in the country about fruit growing at the time. And it was used largely for about 70 years uh, by fruit growers. But he recommended scraping the tree trunks uh, to get off any loose bark and to prevent any overwintering insects from, um, from living on the tree. And then also, in addition to that, uh, painting the tree trunks white. And part of, there's a couple different reasons for that. One is it also helps prevent uh, from having pests uh, burrow underneath the bark. Um, any type, it'll prevent against any type of borers that'll go into the, the tree trunk. And then it'll also prevent against something called southwest sun injury. So young trees are really susceptible to, uh, to getting too much sunlight and it actually can burn and scorch the bark. So by painting the trunks white, it, it helps prevent it, which actually turned out to be really good. Um, because we've had, I think we've had six or seven days that are over 95, 
here it, it never uh, gets over 95 degrees, maybe three, three times a year. And we've already doubled that. And um, yeah, this week isn't looking much better. So this is helping to keep a lot of that sun um, off of the, the tree trucks. The other thing that I did is, and I, I think you can see it, I, I did complementary planting. So I planted uh, beans in between each of the, the trees. And the reason for that is beans are nitrogen fixers. So they're going to collect, uh, it's, it's amazing, they can collect atm atmospheric nitrogen and bring it down into the roots. And so it's a way of fertilizing your trees uh, without actually having to use any kind of uh, chemical compound or, or you, know, you don't have to dump triple 10 on them. Um, so uh, one of the mistakes that I learned is that as I was, um, uh, planting the beans, I wa over watered them to get them to start and I caused some, uh, well, it was leaning towards root rot with the trees. Um, and you can tell root rot, um, it, it causes a nitrogen de deficiency in the trees. So the leaves, uh, you can see here, some of the other leaves, they start to turn yellow. And um, basically that's an indication that you're either overwatering or underwatering the tree. So um, I assumed I was overwatering. And what I did is I just cleared out uh, the base around the crown of the tree. The crown is where the tree meets the soil. So I just cleaned that out, um, letting it, uh, letting a lot of that moisture evaporate. Um, other things that I did is I uh, put in some complementary planters. So, you know, bordering this whole, uh, bed are onions, uh, which are pest, um, pest confusers. So those are going to deter a lot of the pests and, um, it's been, you know, seems to be working okay. So, uh, we've, you know, some of the things, uh, in terms of tree care that I'm looking at, we, it's been a really strange year. Uh, it snowed on May 14th. So it killed off a lot of, uh, the apricot and the Asian plum varieties, like the blossoms. What happens um, is those are varieties that'll blossom pretty early, and then um, if you get a snowstorm or successive freeze, it'll it'll kill off the blossoms. But um, it's been a great year for plums and peaches. So um, so yeah. But right after it snowed, it, we had about two or three really good weeks of weather, and then we've had near drought conditions um, since about mid June, and um, that combination has led to a lot of fungal diseases. So uh, we've had peach leaf curl and also um, shot hole fungus. Um, and actually both of those are funguses. With peach leaf curl, it's exactly like it sounds. It's the leaf of the peach just crumbles up. And with shot hole, it sounds like some, or it looks like somebody actually took a shotgun and shot it through the trees. So I've had some small cases of that that, that I've been trying to treat and for, Generally, I'll almost always use neem unless I see fungal diseases uh, that are severe, like shot hole or um, leaf curl. And then I'll switch over and use a uh, suspended copper spray. Um, I don't like to use the bag copper. Um, I read a couple of studies where they said that, you know, if you, if you use dry copper and mix it uh, with water and spray it, uh, it, it goes into the soil much more quickly and copper buildup is something that you want to be uh, concerned about. So um, yeah, I've been spraying with copper. The other things that I'm looking for are um, insects. So generally, uh, the things that I have issues with are aphids. And um, aphids, will they'll sort of come up into the top of the tree and you can usually find them on, on the bottom side of the leaf. Um, fortunately, that hasn't really been an issue this year. Um, although you can't see it, Japanese beetles have. So we've had some issues with Japanese beetles, um, which if that isn't too bad, I, I generally won't do anything with that. Um, I won't really spray for them um, until it becomes really bad, but you can see they'll you know, turn your leaves into lace. Um, for aphids and for uh, Japanese beetles, one of the ways uh, 
that you can take care of them without having to spray is to collect them in the evening and in the morning. So I'll uh, come out if you know if there's a tree that has an aphid infestation. I'll come out and just trim off the leaves. Um, you know, at the end of the end of the day, I'll bag them and um, yeah, dispose of them. And the same thing with Japanese beetles; they tend to be a little slower in the morning um, and in the evening, so they're not as big an issue. Can you still hear me, or did we shut off? We can hear you well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, uh, I was going. Oh, am I talking into the void? Um, so okay, so. Um, aphids um japanese beetles uh yeah those are generally some of the, the issues that i'll have here um one thing that i'll note is that um if i have fruit that, that looks damaged or i have leaves that look like they were infected by leaf curl or shot hole i will rake them up immediately and um you know because since they're a fungal disease they'll get back into the soil and you can turn sort of an isolated uh, case into, you know, something that, that's orchard wide um, in, in just one season. So with those leaves, you have sort of three options, which they say bag, bury, or burn. Um, so you either you know, dispose of them in, you know, your, your regular um, waste. You dig a hole and bury them or, or you know, obviously burn them. But you don't want to throw them into your compost. You don't want to um, you know, mulch them into the, to the existing, um, into the existing soil because it'll just continue the fungus or the disease. Uh, in terms of watering, um, I'm pretty fortunate. Like, uh, you know, being in sort of central New York, I don't really have to water. So if I'm if I'm planting a tree in native soil, if I plant in October, uh, I uh, generally don't need to uh, water the trees again. But that said, the you know the first three years it doesn't hurt to water those trees, uh, particularly young trees that are that are working to get established. Um, so for those, uh, most of the time I'll do uh, a drip irrigation system. So the first three years that these were in, I just ran a drip irrigation system to each of the trees to, uh, to help them get, um, to help those roots get established. Um, it changes really depending on the location that you're in. And, you know, it can even change from neighborhood to neighborhood. If I'm planting in soil that, you know, I've had to rework or, you know, to amend uh, significantly, I'll, I'll put in a watering system at least for a few years, but for the most part, I don't water or fertilize the trees. Um, once, you know, once they're beyond that third year, if, if I have to fertilize, it's always with something organic. Um, usually if it's a young tree, I'll, I'll hit that with uh, fish emulsion. So, um, yeah, so that's sort of the, water fertilizing regime. Um, they say that, you know, a tree of this size, um, you know, I, there's somebody from California. If you're in California, a tree of this size is going to need about 10 gallons of water uh, a week. Um, so, and that's um, when you're, you're getting into fruit production because it's taking up a lot more, more water as well. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the, uh, that's the whole summer care program. The, uh, the one thing that, uh, that I'm gonna talk about with summer care also is uh, summer pruning. So uh, with summer pruning, you prune trees during the summer for you know, a few different reasons. One is you're, you wanna control the shape of the tree. So all of these trees are what they call open center trees. So there's four or five primary branches that come off of a base. And what I'm always trying to do with these trees is to keep them going up and out. I don't want any branches going in. So what I can do is during the summer, uh, I'll, I can uh, come in and, and prune out some of those branches that are going into the, the center of the tree. Uh, so any place where branches are doubled up, so here some branches are doubled up. I can take those 
and those are branches that are too close together. Uh, um, in here, there's a branch that's going into the center of the tree. So I'll prune that off as well, and I'll take that out. This is about the, this is a little bit bigger than I had anticipated it was. <laughs> um, typically, I'm not going through and taking out any really large branches. I am definitely not taking out any structural branches. So, and everything that I prune is this year's growth. And you can tell it's this year's growth because it's green. Um, at the base, it might start to get a little woody, but for the most part, this is, this is new green growth. You definitely do not, do not, do not uh, wanna go into even the previous year's growth. Uh, to give you an idea, this is when we did our last workshop. This is how tall the trees were. So there's another, I don't know, five, six feet of growth um, on the top of them at this point. But I'll go in, um, for the most part, what I'm looking for are these, what they call water spouts. So these are in the center of the tree and they're also pointing inward. And so I just want to keep taking these out. So that, that way the tree isn't putting its energy into growing towards the center. It's putting its energy into growing the branches uh, outward. So um, typically what I'll do for stone fruit trees is when I'm pruning, I'll prune about a half inch away from, uh, from the main, they call this a scaffolding branch, right? So this is, this is the scaffold that holds all the, the younger growth. Um, I will only take, you know, I'll prune back to about a half an inch. And part of that is, is that um, during the summer, I generally don't use grafting sealant on it. Um, I'm just, these are all shaping cuts. And, and during the winter, if we have a really severe winter like we have here in New York, I don't want this to freeze and die back to the scaffolding branch and start to kill that. I hope that makes sense. Um, so summer pruning is really just shaping. It's thinning out. Um, the other thing that you're doing is you're creating room um, for light to come into the center of the tree. So I've done a bit of pruning on this tree, um, and I pruned the backside of this so that you can get an idea as to how open it is. And you want that openness so that the sun can come down and actually hit the fruit and let the sun ripen the fruit. And you know, when you're, you're ripening fruit on the tree, that sunlight helps the sugars, uh, you know, it helps the, the fruit ripen and mature. And it does something to the sugars that it, it makes the, the taste 10 times better than if you would have picked it, you know, a week or even two weeks before. So um, the, the final, the third thing that you, you want to achieve with summer pruning is to keep airflow and to be able to let the air move throughout the trees. So I've already had a couple of fungal issues this year, and I'm really big on trying to open up the centers of these trees so that as much air can move through because that'll help cut down the, the fungal, um, fungal issues. So that's sort of summer pruning in a, in a nutshell. And we'll, we'll, come back to that because uh, we're actually going to use some of the things that we summer prune for, for budding. Um, but we'll shift gears and we'll, we'll talk about uh, budding or bud grafting. So um, bud grafting is typically used for uh, propagating peaches and almond varieties. And, um, but you can use it for all different types of stone fruit and it's a way that you can quickly either top work a tree, so you can change what a tree is, um, you know, above a certain line. Um, and it's a way, a quick way to make multi-grafted trees. So it's a pretty simple process. Um, I'll just start by demonstrating on this rootstock. Um, and I'll do the, the bud graft and we'll kind of, and we'll talk about it. So the first type of um, bud graft we're gonna do is called a chip bud. And it's the one that I use the most around here. Um, yeah, we'll launch into this now. So this, uh, this is rootstock. Um, so rootstock is um, 
we reviewed this in another workshop, but I'll do a, a quick one. Um, so rootstocks are, are commonly used uh, because they're more adaptable to different types of soil. And um, so you wouldn't just take the seed of a fruit and plant it into the ground because the seeds are generally uh, mutations of the parent, right? That's an adaptability trait of the tree. So when you have a variety that you like and you want to propagate it, the traditional way of doing that is, is by grafting. Um, and that's either spring grafting, um, which we did in the second workshop, or by bud grafting, which we're going to do today. Um, so uh, this tree is pretty interesting because this is a plum rootstock. And um, on grafted, uh, you can see sort of the marks right here. Last, or no, I guess it was two years ago, I grafted a variety onto it called Puente, or uh, another name for it. It's called Puente on the West Coast. It's called a Dara uh, here on the East Coast. And what it is, is it's a particular type of plum strain that's compatible with cherries. So one of the things that's happened in industrial uh, orchards is that uh, plums aren't as valuable. Like uh, everything has shifted, you know, sort of the, the grocery store, what they wanna buy are berries and small fruits. And so since um, the values of plums have decreased, everybody wants to grow cherries. And so this variety was discovered um, as a way to change over a plum tree to a cherry tree. And it also created the way that I could, uh, I could use in creating the tree of 40 fruit. I would be growing a plum tree. I would graft this Puente variety onto it, let that grow for a year or two, and then I can graft on a cherry variety. So we're gonna bud graft the cherry onto this uh, Puente stock. So I went out to um, one of, uh, I have cherry trees out front, and I selected uh, a piece of this year's growth. And what I was looking for is obviously you want to look for a branch that looks really healthy. Um, you want to make sure that there's no diseases, that it doesn't have any fungal issues to it. Um, and then you also want to look at it and you want to make sure that it has uh, mature growth buds. So at the base of the leaf, you'll see a growth bud. You wanna make sure that those are developed and they're not entirely green. So what I'll do to prep this uh, for budding is um, I'm gonna trim the leaves off, but I'm gonna leave about an inch of the stem, or this is uh, called the petiole. So I'm gonna leave about an inch of the petiole and we'll see where that comes in handy in a second. When you're collecting these branches, it's sort of ideal if uh, you summer prune at the same time. So let's say this branch was growing into the center of this tree. I can prune it out, which helps me shape the tree, and then I can also collect it for budding. Some things with budding, um, you, only want to do it i have like pretty hard cutoff lines like i'll do it july 15th to the end of august and that's it i if i'm really pushed um you know it's staying a lot warmer here throughout the fall you might be able to graft into september but for the most part this is a six week period the other thing is that um unlike spring grafting you can't necessarily store this uh for any longer than a day or two. If you're gonna store it, take the leaves off, um, wrap the bottom in a, in a wet towel and just put it in a refrigerator. But know that it's pretty much every hour that you wait between the time that you collect this and the time that you graft, it's like percentages are dropping that you're gonna have successful grafts. So try to collect the same day that you're gonna graft onto the, the tree. Um, so let's do a, a quick chip graph. And so this is the, I'm gonna try to get this really close. Does that, can you see the branch at all? We could see the branch. Okay, great. Okay, so um, what I'll do is I go in and I clean off, uh, I trimmed off all the lower branches. I'll even 
them up a little bit higher. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is I'm constantly wiping down uh, my tools with um, with alcohol, and that's to just sanitize in between each of the cuts. So what I'm going to do for this bud graft is I'm going to go right here, and I'm going to make a downward cut. It's like a downward, and it's at an angle. Then I'm going to go up, and I'm just going to come back down to that cut. All right, we're going to remove that. Okay, so uh, you know, another name this has been called like a name for this is shield or shield grafting because this starts to mimic the shape of the shield. So I'll come in and I'm going to take, I want to take all of my grafts from the center section. Uh, I don't want to take anything from the bottom. And then this, the wood is still really tender up here. Uh, so you don't want to take it from the top. So if you go right from the middle, and I'm going to try to mimic that cut. I'm going to make a downward cut. I'm going to go above it. And I'm just going to slide underneath it. All right. So that took a pretty hefty chunk. So we're just going to come back. We cut that. Oh, and there is the value of the handle. Um, so one of the things that I did is I actually touched the bottom of that graft with my hands. As I caught it, I touched the underside of the chip. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to take another uh, take another piece. So again, make the downward cut, go above it. I'm just going underneath. I'm going to hold it on my knife and then grab it. And I can use the petiole in order to, uh, you know, as like a handle um, while I'm grafting. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to line up right here, the cambial layer underneath here with the cambial layer of the, the rootstock that I'm grafting to. So you can touch that. What I'm gonna do is slide this down until it catches the knot. And you can see that it lines up with both sides over here. Now, the next thing you do is um, you want to wrap it. So um, a traditional way, uh, well, let's start modern and work our way back. Um, so I'll, what I'll typically use for this is uh, a material called parafilm. So it comes in rolls, uh, half inch sections. Um, it stretches, and the other ideal thing with parafilm is that the parafilm uh, degrades. So as this, uh, you know, this, but you can just leave it on throughout the winter and just let it go. So I made two passes. I went down below the bud. I'm coming back above it. And what I'm trying to do is uh, secure and cover every part of that incision. So the other good thing with, uh, with uh, using parafilm to, to graph with is you don't have to tie a knot to fix it to itself. And there you go. Um, what I would do is if, um, you know, if I was feeling really confident in this graph, Typically, what I'll do is I'll put on two grafts, um, but let's just say this was the last graft I would do on this tree. I would set the tree aside. I'd let it sit um, all winter. And then as soon as the tree starts to, to break dormancy in the spring, I'll come back in and I'll prune above the, the graft. Usually, you'll prune it a diagonal so that Water will come off, and you put a little bit of pruning sealer on it. But um, yeah, so just go quarter inch above the graft, prune, and you want to do that the following spring as the tree starts to break dormancy. What happens is the root system will send up all the nutrients to this bud, and um, it's not uncommon for them to grow two, three feet um, just within that first year. 
So another material that you can use for, uh, for doing budding, um, and one that was probably more common, I would say, even just you know, 15 years ago, uh, is using a polypropylene tape. So I'm making another shield. I'm gonna hold that shield in my hand. Um, if I'm putting multiple uh, buds onto one stem, what I wanna do is make sure that they're pointing in different directions. I don't want them both to be pointed in the same direction because then you get two branches that are the same. So we'll turn this just a little bit. Go down. All right. So we'll take this. We're going to seat that. And then polypropylene um, is the same material that um, they make sandwich bags out of. You can buy it in rolls. Um, this is from Ellie Cook. Um, you can buy it in rolls or, you know, I've been in a pinch uh, a couple of times and um, I've actually just cut down sandwich bags and use them. Um, one of the things that, you, uh, that I like to do when using polypropylene is wet the edges. So if I'm doing 100 graphs, I'll just have, uh, have water with me and um, you know, we'll wet them. And what it, you know, one of the advantages to it let's see, is that after it's wetted, it essentially creates a greenhouse underneath this graph and helps it heal in. So one of the reasons why you're you're doing budding in July and August is because it's the, the most humid time of the year. And that humidity is helping um, helping trap the uh, the moisture in here. It's helping it heal more quickly. What you have to do with polypropylene, it's not self-adhesive. So what I do is I'll just make this last pass. I'll come in, pinch the tape slide it underneath and just seal it and break it like that. Um, the, a couple of things. Um, one is these, um, in addition to, to being handles that you can use for doing the budding, the petiole is also an indicator. So within 10 days, you'll see this either turn yellow or you'll see it just uh, wither. If it turns yellow, that means the graft was successful. If it withers and turns brown or falls off, that means that the graft was unsuccessful. So um, it's, it's kind of great because unlike, you know, I, I find budding to be the most challenging and that's, that's mostly because you're, you're waiting so long to find out if, if this is gonna be successful. I mean, you're gonna do these graphs in July and most likely you're not gonna know if it was successful to the following March. Uh, the other thing with using polypropylene is that um, you're going to want to trim it off, uh, usually about two to three weeks after you make the initial, um, the initial graph. And so what you'll wanna do is on the north side of the, the branch, uh, you'll just want to run a knife along the back and just peel that off. And man, that went everywhere. Um, so that's uh, one way of doing it. And then another way that, that I've, uh, I don't know, kind of messed around with. So um, sort of 100 years ago, what they were doing is they were using um, Cecil. So um, they were just using strands of it, or they were using uh, reeds. So you can um, you can put the the graft in place. This is if you really want to go organic um, with uh, with the grafting. So you can see how I'm wrapping it in place. Obviously, I would want to try to get these uh, a lot tighter than what I'm achieving right now. You want to still leave. Another thing I should note is that you, I personally 
I like to leave the bud, you know, the bud that's at the base of the leaf, I like to leave that exposed. Um, but you can wrap that. And then what you would do is uh, seal that with um, like a grafting sealant. So this is like grafting sealant that I made. Um, it's got like lamb's tallow, pitch, and I don't even rosin. You know. <laughs> so um, it might be a good spot for some questions. OK, got a lot of questions for you. Um, OK. All right, so you just, I'll keep going, and then you just let me know if you wanted to get back to, um, you know, any other content, but I'll start off. Um, so okay. I'll start from I'll start from the beginning. Um, some folks just had questions about the paint, um, what kind of paint, and uh, if you can explain a little bit more about painting. And then one person mentioned that they've seen it done in other countries, but it's not actually paint. It's more of a mixture of something with calcium. Yes. God, I'm such a bad workshop host. Um, okay, so uh, they uh, what it what I use is a mixture of fifty percent. Um, acrylic paint and 50% water. So it's very much watered down uh, paint. The, um, in the past, I, I think they did it here with lime. So like a hundred years ago, I think they were doing it with lime. I, I can't be sure. I would have to check a book, you know, check a book on that. And I don't know about, uh, you know, calcium. So that's something I would have to look into, but I, these are all, um, I use indoor house paint, make sure it's acrylic latex based. And it's great because like any, you know, if you go to any recycling center, there's always like that, you know, half used uh, pot of paint sitting around. You can just, I uh, just mix them all together and make a hodgepodge of it and did these. So yeah, that was, that was a great question. All right. Okay. And then the other question pertains to the shaving the bottoms of the trunk um if you can just uh yeah what is the scraping of the tree trunk done with yeah so god i, I really am bad at this workshop. so this is um this is a, a paint scraper for the for um my i've used it on my house uh for redoing windows or woodwork um it's just got a metal piece on it and it's not i didn't like i'm not trying to like scrape through to get to the wood of the tree um what i'm doing is if there's any rough areas just scraping that off um because you'll notice in in fruit trees like if you if you try to grow a cherry tree in new york you are going to have problems with canker i think it's just sort of endemic to it um so and and when the tree gets canker the the art of the cherry tree will start to to turn back Right. And just by taking that off, you know, you're, you're reducing the amount of moths, um, caterpillars and moths that that will later affect the upper part of the tree. So, yeah, but it, that, it's like a gentle touch. Yeah. OK, thanks, Sam. So moving on to questions about copper. One person asked for suspended copper. I am bewildered by the different types of copper available online. Can you recommend what to look for when buying this? And then also some other questions about dry copper. What brand of dry copper for fungi? Can you repeat what you said about the dry copper? Yeah, so this is um, this is what I use. It's the bonide, uh, you know, liquid suspended copper. Um, it's concentrate. So I, I actually, you know, if you have one tree, this is uh, perfect for it. You put about, see for this, it's like two tablespoons into a sprayer. This will do a whole tree and it's fine. The thing that I bought that was like, this changed my life was like, this is like a battery powered sprayer, um, which, you know, if you're dealing with more than one tree, uh, it's, it's really great because it, the, the power of it um, actually gets more into the tree. Uh, you know, so I, I'll never have to spray the top sides. Whenever I'm spraying the trees, what I'll do is I'll, I'll spray, you know, in, right here. 
you know, I'll always spray that direction. And, um, you know, I'll just work my way up each branch to apply the copper. Um, I don't use any of the, the powdered copper. Um, and, and the reason for that is, um, I think they use some sort of colloidal that suspends the, the copper in, uh, you know, in the water in this. And, um, you know, so I, I, I read it in a research paper that came out of a university where they said that, you know, if you mix dry uh, powder into water, when you spray it, it's going to run off the tree more quickly unless it's suspended in, in the solution. So that's one of the reasons why I shifted from it. And I also, do, for that reason, I don't uh, make Bordeaux mix um, or anything like that. So, yeah. And then what type, uh, when do you spray? What type, what time of the year? All right. So it's um, usually it's pretty much based on the year before um what i spray so i do at least one if not two dormant sprays so those will take place in october when the trees lost usually 50 to 80 percent of its leaves and um so I'll, I'll i'll spray with uh copper then then right as the tree breaks dormancy i'll i'll spray with copper again um and then after that I will spray with neem usually t every 10 to 14 days until, um, unless I notice something. Like if I see leaf curl, I'll switch over to copper. Um, but I'm always trying to use as little copper as possible um, because it can accumulate in the soil um, and it can be m more detrimental to, um, to, to a lot of micronutrients that you're trying to, to bring up into the tree. So. Yeah, I'll I'll go. I'll be looking for bugs and um, fungal issues up until the time that they fruit, and so June, July, and then stop. You know, if if the trees look great and healthy, I won't spray them. Yeah, but um, yeah, so that, those are rare years. <laughs> Okay, great. And speaking of fungus, we had some questions about fungus. We have fungus that shriveled our lovely early summer cherries. I was told that it was a fungus and we should spray in the spring. Can Sam recommend that? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Um, they, they said, we have fungus that shriveled our lovely early summer cherries. Yep. Okay, yeah, that sounds like brown rot. So that's again, copper yeah yeah you want to use that yeah even what i would do is if you want to get a good set you know use it again um as the trees start to break dormancy so even before it blossoms okay great um then we have a question about drip irrigation if you know good tutorials and then questions specifically for drip irrigation in first few years how often does it run slash how much water so what I, I try to do with, with the fruit trees, and I don't, okay. So this, a lot of the things that I, I know from this, I've learned from, from orchardists. So, uh, you know, people that have taught me things. And um, I've, I've heard from quite a few that they say that stone fruit trees in particular like to be stressed, right? That they'll, they'll actually produce better fruit if they're slightly water stressed. So you don't want to have them water all the time. So I, I will water them all at once every seven to 10 days. You know, I, I don't break it up throughout the week. You, you want it to be one sort of one good saturation of the soil and that's it. Um, I don't really know any good drip irrigation tutorials. Um, I'm sure there's gotta be, um, there's got to be a hundred of them um, that you can find. But um, yeah, again, you know, for a young tree, I you know, you're looking five to 10 gallons for a mature tree should have 10 gallons. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. I have more questions. Should I keep asking them? Yeah. How are we looking for time? 
We have 10 more minutes. Oh, we got to do some grafting. Okay. So yeah, let's do another kind of grafting and then maybe I can do the, um, yeah, let's, we'll do the grafting because I think that's what most people came for. Um, okay. So, all right. Um, so chip budding, um, all right. Is that branch centered in the picture? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Great. Um, okay, so I mentioned that the type of grafting that that I uh, I use just because I'm in Central New York is chip budding. Um, if you live somewhere where it's hotter, um, well, yeah, it's getting hotter here. Uh, if you live somewhere where it's hotter, there's another type of budding that you can use called T budding. So with T budding. Uh, or the same principle, but you'll see. So you're going to take a knife and you're, you're going to cut all the way around. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut about an inch. Let's go an inch and a half. Right. Um, and then you're going to use, I find it really helpful. This is actually a budding knife. Um, so I'll show you two different versions of this. Um, this is the, I don't even know how much I paid for that. It's a French budding knife. Um, here's the five, $5 uh, Amazon type. But so what I've done is I've made this cut across, I made the cut down. And the reason why you wanna use a budding knife is that you're gonna take that rounded edge and you're gonna lift the bark. Right. So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to get underneath the bark here. So you can e use either this part or this part even works even better. And we're just lifting the bark away from the, the branch. Another sort of grafting hint is that it's good to, um, if you can, water your tree. Uh, the day before you want to graft to it. Um, so what I'm going to do is pretty much the opposite of, of the cut that I made before. I'm, and try to mimic this. So I'm going to cut across here. But instead of going from the top, I'm going to try to go from the bottom. And I'm going to scoop this bud right off the branch. I'm going to hold it. And I mean, since I'm, you know, doing some damage on this tree, I'm trying to make this as quick as possible. Since I have a slanted edge down at the bottom, what I'm going to do is push this and slide it in underneath the cambium. If I need to, I can take the top part of this and I can force it down. Then any excess. I just come across, take that out, and that's a key bud. I'll take the paraffin. And I'm going to wrap it up really quick. Uh, this is really advantageous if you're somewhere where it's hot, right? You, you see in this type of budding, that bud isn't really exposed to the heat. And so you'll have uh, a much better chance of success with it. Um, that said, you know, I was in Switzerland, uh, you know, just uh, last summer and I was touring orchards and they all use uh, this key budding process. And the reason they call it key budding is, you know, that initial cut and then this cut. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say is that, um, you know, you've probably heard of fruit cocktail trees and what they'll do with fruit cocktail trees is they'll use a rootstock. So typically they use a level rootstock. That's the most common rootstock for peach varieties. And it goes straight up and they'll put on a plum and apricot and um, possibly a, a nectarine variety grafted onto it. And 
so it'll have these four buds. So, you know, if the, if the buds are successful, it takes and, you know, it works, you have a, a tree with four different varieties grafted to it. So um, we'll just do another uh, really quick um, one of these tea buds. And um, yeah, we can kind of go from there. So we'll just, and what you're looking for really is, um, actually I'm gonna do it down here because I think it'll be better for this picture. You're looking for an area that doesn't have any branches coming off. Uh, the bark hasn't been damaged at all. Um, other things I'll, I'll just say is be really careful where you get your stock from. Um, I wouldn't just collect it from any tree. Uh, you don't know any damage or any, you know, diseases that tree might have. So, you know, you definitely want to make sure that you're getting it from somewhere that's um, a reliable source. Okay, do we have more questions? Yes, we have a lot more questions and I don't think we'll get to all of them, but I will um, start asking from where we left off. Um, and one of them was, I'll, I'll ask about grafting. In shield grafting, do you cut out any existing bud on the receiving plant or just cut anywhere on the recipient? Mm. Uh, cut anywhere on the recipient. Um, and actually you don't want to cut out, you want to avoid any existing buds. So generally the best, and also the other thing, you know, I think I mentioned it, but I, I would just sort of stress it is that you have a better success rate. If you're grafting, if you're taking material from this year's growth and grafting it onto a branch of the tree, that's this year's growth, if that makes sense, right? So you don't want to use any, you know, don't, this is two year old wood, um, which you can get away with sometimes, but for the most part, wrapped onto the current year's growth. Yeah, and avoid buds. So. Okay, great. So maybe two more questions, more about grafting. If you graft cherries on plums, what plum rootstock works best to prevent borers? To prevent borers, um, you know, I if I was gonna do that, I would probably. Well, so this is the, um, you know, this. So you have the Moroblin stock. You can put this graft anywhere, right? So um, you can grow this plum root stock for two or three feet, and then put your gra grafts there. So it's a way that you can dodge issues that plums might have or your cherries might have in your area. So, you know, an option for you might be to grow out your plum until it ha it's, it's big enough that you can graft um, two to three feet high on it. And because I'm assuming you're, you're talking about cherry borers, but I mean, there's also plum borers too. So <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a lot of issues. Um, but yeah, that would probably be, be my advice. There's only, you know, as far as plum rootstock goes, there's only a few. Uh, the one that's most widely used is Mirabilin. Um, There's a Mirabilin 29C, which is a, a semi-standard. Um, but other than that, there's only really like St. Julian um, and Mariana, which are both, they both have different, um, yeah, different characteristics to it. So. That's a very elaborate question. That might be a whole workshop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Sam. We, it is now 1 p.m., so unfortunately, we're awesome. out of time. Um, I still have a lot more questions, but I'll send them to you, Sam. And um, 
For everybody, uh, thank you so much to Sam Van Aken, our facilitator, for this amazing presentation. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Sam. And then we'll have um, other workshop series that we can uh, email everybody about. And I'm going to stop recording. Thank you again. To